Chapter 3 The Evidence for Perfection, Precision, and Providence Introduction Some of the greatest and clearest evidence of all the existence of the Creator, be He exalted, is the obvious perfection and precision in the living creatures and providing them with everything they need. Allah, be He exalted, said, Pharaoh said, So who is the Lord of you two, O Moses? He said, The Lord is He who gave each thing its form and then guided it. Taha 49-50 Simple contemplation in ourselves and our surroundings makes us easily realize the greatness of God's creation and the vastness of His provision for us and all His creation, as He gave each one of us what we need for living. Then He taught all His creation the best ways to sustain their lives and search for foods and provisions suitable for their existence rearing their offspring, and fleeing from their enemies, and many other ways of guidance. And this is totally enough for one to be certain of the existence of an extremely wise, omnipotent, all-knowing, most merciful Creator. Because an intelligent human knows a thing by looking at its marks and imprints. And when we find something so intelligently and carefully and purposefully made, we would immediately know that behind such precision a being who has tremendous knowledge and wisdom, because randomness or a being or anything that's deprived of knowledge and wisdom could never produce anything orderly and purposefully. Hence was the great importance of the evolution theory for people who are deluded and deceived. That theory that they use in order to instill confusion and doubt about this is clear, delightful evidence. A theory that tries to present humanity with an alternative explanation of the existence of life with all its rich manifestations. Without the need of a knowing and wise creator claiming that there are pure material mechanisms that worked on producing this extremely complicated and intricate biological system billions of years ago, almost 3.8 billion years. This theory gained supporters in even whole countries mobilizing their laboratories and armies of professionals to swear by it. And since that time, people were divided into all kinds of groups. Some don't know much about it. To these people, the theory says that humans descended from apes, nothing more and nothing less. And to some others, it's the magical solution to get rid of the thought of servitude and obedience to the Great Creator. And some of them know the gaps in that theory and the evil it causes. And some others truly think that it's the fruit of science and enlightenment accumulating through the ages, and that it's the salvation of all humanity from the grip of evil and conflicts. It's needless to say that a believer must learn everything about this theory and understand how to correctly discuss it in order for them to be armed with the necessary knowledge crucial for our time and age, and also teach their family. A non-believer must also learn everything about this theory so they don't fall into the pit of delusion and mythology, thinking that science had already proved it all, even though science has got little to do with the delusions of this theory. But this time, our battle won't be with the game of jargon as it was in the previous chapter, but a true battle with the theory itself, because there is no misunderstanding here that we should correct. Instead, we have two choices. The first choice accepting the evolution theory that claims that life can be explained by material mechanisms without the need of a creator. The second choice is to destroy the theory and show the correctness of the evidence for the perfection and precision that points to one creator. I won't be addressing every single detail of the theory, because that would need an independent book, but I will present some of the most famous evidence and their refutations. I will also mention some dilemmas that stab into the heart of the theory and destroy it, God willing. The evolution theory hypothesizes that all the forms of life we know originated in the beginning by means of random mutations of the DNA of simple organisms. We don't know where they came from or how they formed, and these mutations result in new characteristics of the living organism, which might be useful or useless or even harmful. And here comes the role of natural selection to choose and keep everything useful for the organism in order for it to survive and reproduce, which the organism acquired from successive strokes of luck. On the other hand, this same process eliminates most of the traits that are useless or inadequate for living and reproduction and survival and this elimination would be effective due to the persistent conflict over limited resources in nature. It seems that the origin of this idea was economical, blossoming inside Darwin's head after a lecture he heard from the famous economist Thomas Malthus.
The end result of this process is all the beauty and creativity and perfection in the living organisms after this long journey life had spent on Earth, during which it formed this living kingdom in a very slow and gradual manner that we can observe during our short lives. And every time the theory faces a dilemma, it is transformed into a new alternative theory or it too evolves into new theories so it can escape problems. And wow, how many times it's shifted since Darwin's time until today. Because what matters is that evolution stays right in its pure material explanation of life without the need of a creator. Because then, all this precision would be a direct result of blind natural mechanisms. And the notion of the existence of a wise and knowing creator would be just an illusion. That is why any attempt to reconcile between evolution theory and religion is in actuality fabrication and joining between two paradoxes. But refusing the existence of the natural mechanisms or their effects is also a wrong approach to refute the theory. And this is what I alluded to in the last question in Chapter 1, with the example about the Sun and the nuclear reactors on planet Pluto. The true battlefield is proving or disproving that these mechanisms are capable of bringing this living kingdom into existence or not, and if they are able to present a sufficient explanation for the phenomenon of life or not. If they are, then evolution is true, and if they aren't, then evolution theory is wrong. Number 1 some of the most famous evidence of evolution. 2. The Tree of Life One of the foundations of the evolution theory is that all living beings have a common ancestor. That's why Darwin depicted the scenario of life evolution as a single tree, which always branches indefinitely. And this is a picture of a paper from Darwin's notebook, figure 14, dating back to 1837, i.e. 20 years before publishing the book of Origin of Species, 1859. So the idea of the tree of life is essential to Darwin, and this is very logical, because if species have really originated from each other by means of mutations and natural selection, then surely if we go back in time we will see the species merge together until only one kind remains. That is the base of the tree from which life flourished. But did science prove the accuracy of this original hypothesis in the evolution theory? The answer is no on all levels even by using all what could constitute a measurement of this alleged kinship between all living things. 1. Building Darwin's tree through genetic similarity. For example, if we find a gene in one living species and find the same gene in another species, then this orthologous gene in different kinds of species within different kinds of species can be evidence for the existence of a common ancestor between these different species. But studying this matter closely and attempting to assemble a tree based on this polygenetic approximation, we find that such a tree is pulled from its roots and is ripped to shreds. Because as this scientific paper says, such results suggested that the simple notion of a single tree of life that would accurately and definitively depict the evolution of all life forms was gone forever. And similarly states this other scientific paper, a tree thinker may choose to ignore conflicting signals, as if it was noise even if legitimate evolutionary events underlie it. Also from the same paper, in this paper we investigate the phylogenetic signal of four data sets in order to address a simple question. Do the phylogenies of orthologs really favor tree thinking and thus justify attempts of tree reconstruction? Can we be reasonably confident that their history is free of LGT? We observe that no unique common history can be established for these genes. In all cases, genes fail to favor a single tree. We also observe that some of these genes support incongruent histories. Consequently, the tree thinking on which gene concatenations rest does not precede the phylogenetic conclusions, nor is it a priori a safe phylogenetic practice. So if we use genetics to depict the relationship between living beings, we won't find any tree nor will we find any branches extending from each other, and this is considered a refutation of the evolution theory and its prophecies. 1-1-2 Building Darwin's Tree Through Similar Proteins What if we put genes aside and try to assemble Darwin's tree using a different component, similar proteins in different species? In reality, we will get the same result, and we won't be able to find any trace of that alleged common ancestor. 1-1-3 building Darwin's tree through the fossil record. Okay, let's put all of this aside and go to the fossil record and dig through the layers of the earth for traces and fossils of animals that lived millions of years ago. 
Maybe these can tell us the full story of life and bring life to Darwin's tree. But the truth is that the fossil record doesn't support the idea of the common ancestor, nor does it even support gradual evolution from a being into another. Here we quote the book, The New Evolutionary Timetable, Fossils, Genes, and the Origin of Species. Species that were once thought to have turned into others have been found to overlap in time with these alleged descendants. In fact, the fossil record does not convincingly document a single transition from one species to another. Another quote from the same book, The fossil record itself provided no documentation of continuity, of gradual transition from one animal or plant to another of quite different form. And here's a quote from the book, Macroevolution, Pattern and Process. The known fossil record fails to document a single example of phyletic evolution accomplishing a major morphologic transition. 1-1-4 Building Darwin's tree through the external morphology. Alright, let's just forget about all of this and try comparing between species by means of morphological appearance, the outward appearance of a living organism, which was the basic method of observation in Darwin's days that he used to assemble his alleged tree. Because during that time, information about genes wasn't available, of course. For example, when you observed the resemblance between humans and monkeys, or between several living species, you could deduce that these have a common ancestor, meaning that all these similar-looking species are granddaughters and grandsons of a single grandfather or grandmother who could be extinct now. This is the origin from which all species appeared into life, and he is the focal point out of which extended these species like distant rays. So if we see these similarities, we could easily conclude that they have a single origin. Then this idea expanded from morphological appearance to similarity of genetic makeup, or genes as discussed above. So similarity, morphological or genetic, in the literature of evolution theory is an evidence and a clue that proves the existence of a common ancestor. And if we find two species which are similar to the point that they are identical and no common ancestors could possibly link the two, then this will contradict the evolution theory axiom that states that morphological appearance is evidence that the two species have a common ancestor from which they both evolved. But evolutionists are astonishing in their excessive use of logical paradoxes. They use morphological appearance as evidence for the existence of common ancestry, which in turn they consider an evidence for evolution, which is an effect. So if the similarity can't be due to common ancestry, they don't admit that the evidence is refuted and that it had lost its value. They rather use evolution as evidence for the evolution of those similar and distant species, calling this convergent evolution. So, similarity here becomes an effect, which happens some way or another because of the evolution. And that is a logical fallacy known as circular argumentation, or arguing from the point of difference, where the premise is just as much in need of proof or evidence as the conclusion. For example, if the chimpanzee has the most resemblance to humans of all animals, then the evolution theory predicts that there are a common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees, and also predicts that this common ancestor's order on the tree of life is closer than that of the common ancestor between humans and cockroaches, for example. Because a cockroach's morphology is far different than humans. So if there's a new evidence that cockroaches are closer to humans than chimps, then that would refute Darwin's idea of considering the resemblance of morphological appearance of different species as evidence that they evolved from each other. And this would also destroy the tree Darwin imagined to be a big family tree of all living species. And that is exactly what convergent evolution did when it showed that morphological resemblance to the point of being identical is never an evidence of kinship or the existence of a direct common ancestor. For example, placental mammals, who give birth to fully developed offspring like humans, monkeys, and elephants, and marsupials, whose fetus's formation is perfected inside their marsupium like kangaroos and flying squirrels. The morphological resemblance between these cannot be due to a direct common ancestor, because, according to the Darwinian scenario, their ancestors diverged from each other before the extinction of dinosaurs, i.e. around 160 million years ago, when that alleged common ancestor was an animal that looked more like contemporary rats and rodents. And then placental animals evolved from each other independently, from the marsupials, meaning that this placental flying squirrel in figure 15 is closer to elephants and humans than the marsupial flying squirrel on the left, which in turn is closer to the kangaroo and koala than it is to the placental flying kangaroo. 
Similarly, when you look at these two fishes above in figure 16, you would think that they have a common ancestor, which is the fish underneath them, or so predicts the evolutionary theory. But you could be shocked when you learn that the gray fishes below in figure 17 is much closer to the yellow fishes above than the yellow fishes are close to each other. The same thing is repeated in all these species in figure 18. As this is not an individual or an exceptional case, but rather it's the dominant case, and tens of examples of this phenomenon can be observed in all living beings, birds, reptiles, insects, fungus, fish, plants, amphibians, and proteins and enzymes too. More examples can be referred to on Wikipedia by searching under List of Examples of Convergent Evolution. And here are some photos of some examples of this convergent evolution that is not based on a direct common ancestor. Figures 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Figure 19. Old Dutch Capuchin and Camorner Tumbler. Pill Millipede, Pill Bug. Figure 20. Euphoria and Cactus. Figure 21. Yellow-throated Longclaw and Eastern Meadowlark. Figure 22. Hedgehog and Tenric. Figure 23. Hypokinemus subflava and Hypokinemus peruviana. Figure 24. Woodchuck and Wombat. Figure 25. Astrophytum asteri. Euphorbia obesa. Figure 26. Praying Mantis and Mantispidae. Figure 27. Number 1. Junk DNA. One of the famous evidence of evolution is junk DNA. These are parts of the DNA that don't carry the genetic codes necessary to create proteins, and which, until now, have no function. So evolutionists claim that this non-coded DNA is the remains of the accumulations of the evolution theory that has been in action for millions of years, and that all that junk used to be functional one day, but then were replaced by better ones. Therefore, those were suspended from work until they are completely gotten rid of. It's like you've bought a new television set and threw the old one in the place where you keep the old junk until you get rid of it. You might be disappointed if you know that 98% of our DNA is junk DNA. But this concept collapsed when a group of scientists developed a big international project for the objective of creating an encyclopedia of human DNA called ENCODE where these non-coded parts of our DNA were examined, and they were concluded that 80% of this non-coded DNA perform biochemical activities. So, these perform a specific job inside the body that we are still discovering until today. The researchers in this project published 30 scientific papers in one week, in one of the most famous scientific magazines, Science Nature in an action that looked like offering condolences to the theory of junk DNA, which became among the dead junk, or so it seemed. This week, 30 research papers, including six in Nature and additional papers published by Science, sound the death knell for the idea that our DNA is mostly littered with useless bases. A decade-long project, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, ENCODE, has found that 80% of the human genome serves some purpose, biochemically speaking. I don't think anyone would have anticipated even close to the amount of sequence that ENCODE has uncovered that looks like it has functional importance, says John A. Number 2. Bad Design Another favorite evidence among evolutionists is the bad design of some organs in the living beings. One example they keep singing tirelessly is the bad design of the inverted retina in humans especially and in the vertebrates in general because when light enters the eye, it has to pass through several inner layers of its neural apparatus before reaching the photoreceptors, which prevents some of the light from reaching the retina, causing blind spots. The atheist Richard Dawkins mockingly says in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point towards the light, with their wires leading backwards towards the brain. He would laugh at any suggestion that the photocells might point away from the light and their wires departing on the side nearest the light. But again come the studies and research to reveal the fallibility of evolution evidence, and to confirm the importance of the existence of the retina with this specific bizarre design. Because photosensitive retinal ganglion cells have high metabolism rate, and they need this direct supply of nutrition of the interacting cells. 
And because the retina in vertebrates is distinctive from that of cephalopods, where photosensitive cells exist in front of the network of nerves and capillaries directly in front of the light, it is distinctive because of the existence of the layer of retinal pigment epithelium, RPE, and this strange construction of the vertebrate's eye performs an important role with respect to this layer. And there is also a recent study that confirms that this situation is the most perfect for us, because we need the red and green colors in our daylight vision, and blue in our night vision, and this network of nerves in front of the photosensitive cells intensify red and green colors more than ten times, focusing them in rods and focal points on the photosensitive cells, especially on the cones, which process the colors, and those are less sensitive than the rods. Therefore, they needed this specific design to support this process. This was first proved by using computers, then with practical experiments on guinea pigs. The conclusion is that evolution evidence is mostly based on fallacies, supported by a lot of noise, accompanied by oppression towards anyone who would dare face Darwinism with its problems to expose its fallacious arguments, or show that there is an intelligent order created by the most genius of experts, and prove that life phenomenon can't be explained unless by attributing it to an all-knowing, all-wise creator who created life in all perfection and beauty, be he exalted. That, or at least the arguments which support intelligent design, if we are to use terminological language. And in the rest of the chapter, I will list a number of arguments that contradict Darwinism and support intelligent design. Number 1. The Problem of Coding The revolution of communication we are witnessing is all based on the idea of coding. And we've been using this simple idea in much more developed ways since Samuel Morris invented the telegraph. The result being great inventions like the telephone, the radio, TV, computers, faxes, printing devices, CDs, and almost everything around us. The case is simply to define the basics of the system you want to encode, then assign a specific code to each one of them using your own dictionary, then send it using a speedy medium an electromagnetic wave, for example, to the receptive person after you previously informed them with the dictionary you used for encoding, so he could decode the symbols. And this is what the International Morse Code Dictionary looks like, figure 28. If someone sent me a message like this, and I don't have a Morse Code Dictionary, it won't mean anything to me, of course. Or I could misunderstand it. I could think that they're being funny or something. But if I know Morse code, I will understand that these symbols mean SOS, a well-known expression that means save our souls. And the conclusion is that the text has no value without a dictionary familiar to both the sender and the receiver. And as we know, the scientific name of DNA is the genetic code, as it doubtlessly is a code system. Even our five senses are encoded too. The eardrum converts the sound waves into different forms of mechanical energy. Then they are sent to the winding tunnels of the inner ear, and it transforms them into electromagnetic pulses with different wavelengths and frequencies. And they are sent to the brain, which in turn decode these signals, and we get to hear the different sounds we hear. This is the same mechanism with which our senses of smell, taste, and vision, and touch. Modern technology is really impressive, but the great mechanics of our bodies are even more mind-blowing. Decoding systems are everywhere around us, and with our good knowledge of the decoding systems, we know the importance of the existence of an established dictionary required for both the sender and the receiver. And now the question is, if we assume the probability for a decoding system to formulate in a random way, and if we assume that no one interfered in writing that preserved text within each living being, the genotype, and that no one also interfered in understanding the meaning of the significance of this text, the phenotype, and that all of this took place spontaneously and without intentional planning from anyone, and that it happened in accordance with the well-known evolution mechanics. All of that show that there is a dictionary that's being used to decode the genome. But it doesn't tell us how this dictionary managed to stay changeless in an environment that's bombarded with mutations from every direction. It also doesn't tell us how this dictionary was imposed upon the biological system. As the principles of heredity do preserve the text, but there is no known mechanism that guarantees preserving the dictionary itself, which is necessary for decoding the text. And there is no mechanism that interprets why nature chose this particular dictionary, and not another one. Nor does it tell us where it's kept, 
because programming and decoding need both consciousness and will, where out of an infinite number of symbols, specific ones are chosen. Then each one of this specific number of symbols is given a special interpretation which both the sender and the receiver are obliged to use. This was a dilemma for the materialist model that evolution theory employs to explain life. Some tried to find a physical solution to this problem, assuming that the genetic code is only an illusion and that there is a chemical or a biological or a physical deterministic necessity that drove things into this direction. So is this materialist solution actually possible? 2. We already know there are 20 enzymes of aminoacyl tRNA synthetases, AARSs, which serve to attach the appropriate amino acid onto its tRNA, and each one of those 20 enzymes is assigned to a specific amino acid utilized in producing all the proteins in living organisms. As the enzyme chemically and physically recognizes its specific amino acid, exactly like a key that fits a specific lock. The enzyme here is the lock and the amino acid is the key, and these locks are for the boxes of the tRNA. Each one of these boxes is labeled with an anticodon. So if the message comes from the DNA by the mRNA carrying a group of specific codes and codons and enters into the ribozyme, which is the part responsible for interpreting this message, the result is then that the boxes of the tRNAs that hold specific numbers are brought, and they consequently bring with them their keys and locks. Then these keys are arranged, amino acids, each beside each other according to the message's instructions. In the end, the totality of these keys will be the functional protein that's utilized to form part of the body structures of the living organism, as shown in Figure 29. But this can't be a deterministic chemical explanation for the way genetic code works, for many reasons. 1-1-2 The right-handed and left-handed amino acids have the same chemical composition. If chemical interactions are what control this process, the attachment of codons, the number in the message, to the opposite codon, the number on the box, to the specific enzymes, the locks, then the right-handed amino acids will be also coded like the left-handed ones, because there is no difference in their chemical composition. And because all the difference there is, the geometrical shape of the enzyme, the lock, which always matches with the left-handed amino acids and never with the right-handed ones. But this geometric shape of the enzyme is not a result of necessary chemical reaction, but it's a result of being formed that way and that happened in accordance with the coded information and not by a chemical necessity, stereochemical. And here we fall into contradiction, because we depend upon coding in order to deny that coding is needed and necessary. 2-1-2 There are other reasons for the inaccuracy of the stereochemical interpretation mentioned in this scientific paper, which when the authors tried to get through all the possible solutions to explain the existence of this genetic code, reviewing all the exiting theories since the discovery of the DNA until this day, and concluded the research with this question. Why is the genetic code the way it is, and how did it come to be? The question is still one of the most complicated ones facing the science of biology, and it seems that we're going to spend another 50 years in addition to the previous 50 until we get to have a satisfying answer. The paper also says that questions like, why are there only four nitrogenous bases, not more and not less? Why the codon constitutes of only three nitrogenous bases? And why only 20 amino acids? These are all legitimate questions we need to answer. To the author, the stereochemical theory wasn't a satisfying interpretation, and he mentions some of his reasons. 2-1-2-1 1 There are many amino acids that have more than one codon, like leucine, who has six codons, Schedule 1. This goes against the stereochemical idea, because if the codon, the number in the message, was stereochemically attached to a specific amino acid, the key, there wouldn't have been a space for multiple codons for one amino acid. 2-1-2-2 The paper also mentioned another reason. That is, there are amino acids other than the known 20 biological ones which were a part of the protein composition in the living organisms, and these were inserted in practical experiments inside the cell with some genetic engineering, and they acquired genetic codes, like this research shows. 
And this is evidence that there doesn't exist any stereochemical necessity preventing the encoding of these amino acids. Likewise, there is no stereochemical necessity that requires specifically 20 amino acids out of a great number of them to perform the encoding. 2-1-2-3 It also mentions another reason. The existence of dictionaries different than the standard genetic code. In the mitochondria, for example. And that's the reason this living organism is considered to be one who lives in symbiosis with humans and other living organisms, and not part of them. The existence of more than one dictionary means that there is more than one way to decode the genome. And this clearly shows that the case is not a chemical or a physical necessity, but rather it's one of many possible codes that needs to be chosen out of all the others. And this doesn't have a satisfying explanation within the materialistic frame that uses blind mechanics that don't have a will. That's why Francis Crick suggested, 40 years ago, the theory of frozen accident, which is like choosing 64 random choices out of 10, then freezing the rest and making these a law. What made Crick say that is that he was trying to combine between the fact that there is a mandatory dictionary and the absence of a chemical necessity to explain it. So we devised this mythical solution, and it has been accepted, since it's a materialist solution, even though it's an unsatisfactory one. The evidence that this is an unsatisfactory solution is that the scientific community until this very moment still see that it's necessary to investigate the secret behind this magnificent code. So if coding can't be explained with pure materialist ways, then this invalidates the evolution theory. 1. The Problem of Consciousness a lot of people think that science knows how the process of consciousness and rationalization take place, and that it's a finished case, and they don't know that all what science has is a knowledge of the brain interactions with these processes. And this happened by observing the loss of these processes for reasons of injuries in certain areas of the brain, or by observing the brain's activity during these states by using some electrical and electromagnetic devices, like electroencephalography or magnetoencephalography. But do these provide us with an adequate analysis of consciousness itself? How it happens, and why humans are endowed with this special gift? The answer is no. As the proponents of materialist atheist thought always wish and sometimes think that science proved that the brain or the nervous system possess something that can give us a full explanation of the process of thinking and realization, and consequently be able to explain the phenomenon of consciousness in a materialist way. And this can't be done unless we first know what really happens during these states and what are the mechanics. This hasn't happened yet, and it might never happen. For example, the part of the brain that's responsible for thinking consists of the two frontal lobes. These, like the rest of the brain, consist of nervous cells, which have the sole job of transmitting electrical and neurological signals, neurotransmitters. These are chemical substances controlling the pathways of the signals, so they can be transmitted across the brain. Examples of these are serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, and GABA and others. And using psychoactive drugs, we can raise or lower the level of any of these chemicals. So if consciousness is restricted to the brain chemistry, it would be easy to create a drug that can make you believe in an idea or disbelieve in it. And another that could make you love something and hate another. And a third one that could make you invent something totally unique. And many other things that make human consciousness unique. But all this doesn't exist, as not all drugs affect the brain interactions necessarily for consciousness. But they don't affect consciousness itself, because just like someone can hit another on the head and make them lose consciousness, having caused alteration of the interactions necessary for consciousness, but don't alter consciousness itself, and they can't hit someone on the head in order to convince them of some idea. This is what drugs do. As changing the chemistry and the electricity of the brain don't change consciousness, but it can weaken or strengthen it, or affect its presence or absence. That is why physicist Leonard Mladenow said in a TV interview that there is no physical explanation for consciousness. The justification for the presence of human consciousness had been always that humans had a relatively bigger cerebral cortex than other creatures, especially in the frontal lobes. This is like explaining the existence of water with water, as it doesn't provide us with any valuable information to explain why and how and what consciousness is made of. But this concept, too, was recently destroyed by studies scientists performed using MRI to compare the cerebral cortex of humans to that of great apes. As trying to portray the mind as merely the brain, 
or that it's a process that can be explained within the frame of a natural materialist frame, is a delusion and a foolish attempt. The same thing applies to the illusion of creating a computer that can possess a human-like mind. Because computers can't understand and rationalize and make decisions any more than what they are previously programmed to do. And this is the core difference between algorithms and things like free will and awareness. Because although the computer handles coded electrical signals just like a brain cell does, it's impossible for the computer to understand or rationalize something, which shows that consciousness is not mere handling of a bunch of algorithms. Godel himself argued, based on his famous theorem we discussed in the previous chapter, the incompleteness theorem, that it's impossible to invent a computer that can rationalize and have free will like humans. This argument has been revived by Roger Penrose in his book The Emperor's New Mind, then again in the book Shadows of the Mind, and also the scientific magazine, which is specialized in investigating the truth about human consciousness. And the magazine listed these three questions in its introduction to show that these puzzles are yet to be solved, and they need more research. How does the mind relate to the brain? Can computers ever be conscious? What do we mean by subjectivity and the self? And there are those who think that self-learning skills and computers are considered consciousness. And that's not true, because that is called artificial intelligence and not artificial awareness. It's an unconscious way to achieve efficiency, meaning that the machine performs data analysis and then adopts the strategies that achieve the highest profitable actions. And the wider the database gets with time, the more efficient the performance of those computers get. And all of this takes place without awareness or consciousness. And there is no professional who questions that. Because once again, consciousness and awareness and feeling and free will are not data analysis and following the pathways that achieve the highest profit. If consciousness can't be explained with purely materialist ways, then this contradicts the evolution theory and materialist doctrines in general, and at the same time a clear sign that we all have an awareness of something beyond the world of matter within us, which can't be explained unless by attributing this awareness to powers superior to the limitations of nature. 3. The Problem of Irreducible Complexity If evolution theory is based on the premise that the extremely complex functions happening within the living organisms accumulated gradually through billions of years, and that all the things beneficial to life had been selected during this period of time, until these reached the current state of complexity we are witnessing today, performing all these biological functions in the living organisms, then such a premise is doubtlessly in danger if we find in these living organisms irreducible functions, impossible to have happened by gradual selection. And this is what Darwin himself admitted in his book, The Origin of Species, where he says, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. This means that such an organ is complex in a way that's irreducible, i.e., the job it performs can exist before all the parts consisting that organ are in place. And if a single part is missing, the organ's function absolutely disappears. When you look at such an organ, you know for certain that it must have been purposely designed and perfected, because the function it performs, which is the reason for keeping it, according to the materialist Darwin theory, can only exist as whole. So. If 99% of the organ is in place, its benefit to the body is zero, and it won't be able to perform the job it was assigned to, just like the modern complicated appliances. If you cut a single wire or took a small part out of it, they would be completely non-functional. It's of course very unlikely that these appliances were assembled gradually because of accumulation of the benefits and advantages offered by primitive parts of these appliances. For example, the electric elevator's job is to carry people from lower levels of a building to the upper levels and vice versa. And this function can't be achieved before all parts of the elevator, wires, ropes, and engines, and the big cabin, and before all these things are in place and supplied by the necessary power. All of this has to happen before the elevator can move one centimeter. This is irreducible complexity and can exist randomly without previous planning or wisdom and purpose. But if an organ or an appliance that's complex in a reducible way, meaning that its parts can be independently used, doesn't necessarily need a designer for it to exist as a whole, and it can't be assembled by means of chance and the accumulation of the benefit of its parts provided. 
because each part performs the same job in the end, but with less efficiency. Because if the parts are not beneficial, then natural selection won't find a reason to select them, and gradual accumulation is only helpful in increasing the efficiency of the job and not the job itself. And compared to the electric elevator as an example of irreducible complexity, an example of reducible complexity would be the stairs. One step in the stairs would elevate you one step from the ground. And if you have 25% of the steps necessary to build a staircase in a building that consists of 10 floors, you would have the benefit of being able to move between two or three floors, unlike the elevator, which can't be useful at all unless you fully assemble its parts. The staircase way is what Darwinism thinks that nature adopted in order to accumulate the beneficial parts in the living organism so its current complex parts can now perform their specific jobs. And this theory collapses if this is not the general case for all the organic functions in the living organisms. The truth is that a lot of these organic functions are irreducibly complex. Take the example of the flagellum, blood coagulation, DNA coding, and the immune system, and a lot more other examples. Faced by these, the evolutionists invented the idea of co-option and said that all these irreducibly complex organs, its parts indeed couldn't have the ability to perform any job until all of them are completed. But they had other functions. Some of them disappeared and some others developed and merged into the final function we currently know. And this is how we find the reason that makes natural selection select these parts so they are gathered in order to perform this new complex and irreducible function. Imagine how funny it would be if we apply this concept to the example of the electric elevator. This would be something that only belongs in children's cartoon movies. Because we'd be acquired to use the power of our imagination enough to believe that all the parts of the electric elevator assembled themselves in one place and connected themselves together in the right way. Not with the intention of creating an electric elevator, but they had completely different intentions. For example, the hard wire ropes hanging from the top of the roof to the bottom of the building have been brought by a thief so he can break into one of the apartments. And he also brought strong pulleys so he can use the ropes to lift a big safe he was going to take from inside that apartment. And that safe was big enough to lift two or three people inside it. And at the same time, there was a person in the next building who vowed to God that if a certain wish happens, he would buy an elevator engine and sneak into the next building to put it in the hollow place in the middle of the building. And because of a stroke of luck, there was a third person who'd put it in this specific building too. Electric transformers and connections in order to host a party for all the dwellers of the building. And during the time the thief was moving the safe out of the building, his foot slipped and the big safe fell on the engine and the wires mingled together and the ropes were pulled and a primitive electric elevator appeared, which the dwellers of the building could use later to develop a more sophisticated one. Because even though it's an irreducibly complex apparatus, it came into existence for completely different reasons and the purposes other than creating an elevator. This is the logic of evolution which Dr. Michael Behe questioned in his famous book, Darwin's Black Box. So whomever doesn't find the story of the thief and the elevator difficult to believe is rightfully an evolutionist. And whomever can see this as an extremely superficial way that no sane person can believe or adopt, they are accused by the evolutionists to be irrational and a believer in the myths and the fictitious stories of the ancestors. Moreover, any way of thinking that goes against the logic of evolution is being criminalized, and Michael Behe and his like should be presented at court, as happened in the famous Dover trial, during which the judge issued a decision of prohibiting teaching the theory of intelligent design. On the other hand, evolutionists regard the theory of co-option, the story of the thief and the electric elevator, as hard science and a scientific method that we can use to interpret all cases of irreducible complexity. This is how the evolutionist's mentality deals with any crisis or dilemmas as they reveal some aspects of its lethal deficiencies. And lastly, I'd like to mention something important, which is the fallacious argument that Darwinists use to argue for partial organic functions, or co-option. The complexity argument doesn't refute the existence of partial functions of the organs, but it disproves the notion that natural selection has any role in affecting the current complex functions by means of accumulated partial functions that have nothing to do with the desired complex function. This means that the Darwinian hypothesis of partial organic functions is in truth hollow, 
and what they're saying doesn't bring natural selection back into the scene. They are only portraying this matter as pure chance, and saying that the existence of these complex organic functions happened because of chance, and without a guiding mechanism, like selection, is an act of sheer folly that can't be called a scientific theory. The example of the electric elevator didn't say that its parts have no independent partial functions, but it mentioned that each part had a function, and mentioned the reason of assembling all these parts at one time. But even if each part had a beneficial use on its own, and had been selected for a purpose, assembling a complete elevator was complete chance, a chance that happened on separate levels. But it's chance anyway. Imagine three people standing in front of the elevator in the example. The first one says that the elevator was assembled by chance. The person is foolish, of course. The second one says it was intentionally designed because it couldn't have any beneficial use unless all its parts are in place and in perfect coordination, and this can happen haphazardly. And the third one says that it's neither chance or designed, and he tells them the story of the thief and the elevator as a possible scenario. So, is there a difference between the first person and the third person stories? The answer is no as both of these stories support chance. Only the first person story depicts a single stroke of chance, and the third one story is also chance, albeit divided into smaller strokes of chance, so it can seem more logical. But this doesn't actually change anything, because if natural selection selects things that have nothing to do with the final function in order to affect that function in the end, this is really aimless and not a selective mechanism, but a completely random process that could keep on moving between partial functions indefinitely without ever affecting any irreducibly complex organ. Just like this rat, representing natural selection, which keeps chasing the cheese parts in the opposite figure, which represents partial functions, because there is no reason driving it to go for the pizza, the irreducibly complex function. So it can't be said that the rat possesses a special sense or affinity with the pizza, and if it does reach the pizza one day, this would happen because of pure luck. And it can keep on moving in these closed paths forever, chasing and eating the cheese bits without ever reaching the pizza. Number 4. The Problem of Cambrian Explosion In the beginning of this chapter, I mentioned some of the evidence that refutes the idea of the Tree of Life, which Darwin imagined. But there is no evidence stronger than the Cambrian Explosion evidence, because it's an observation that completely contradicts the idea of gradual evolution by means of natural selection, which is the core of the theory. The Cambrian Explosion is a term assigned to a biological phenomenon that happened 550 million years ago, preserved in the fossil record, and it means the sudden appearance of most major animal phyla, around 95% of the living animals' phyla we know today. This one contradicts the theory of evolution on two sides. 5-1- First, all these phyla appear without having to have evolved from common ancestors. They continued to exist the way they appear during the Cambrian period until this day, and this applies to the vast majority of the living animal's phyla. The evolution theory predicts that the fossil records will reveal to us long-chain links of transitory animals in between all these phyla, as presented in Figure 30. But then the data of scientists found in the Cambrian explosion indicates that the relationships between these phyla are completely independent. They started this way and remain this way as shown in figure 31. 5-2- Second. The time span of the Cambrian explosion is believed to be around 13 million years, as this explosion took place sometime between the Cambrian period and the pre-Cambrian period. And this period of time compared to lifetime on Earth is considered a few moments or a few minutes if we imagine that life began on Earth 24 hours ago, in other words. The Earth would be devoid of almost all life forms, except for some primitive forms of life and very few multicellular organisms, until 21 hours pass, and within the next two or three minutes, the Cambrian explosion happens, and most of the animals we know today appear into existence. This completely contradicts the idea of the slow, gradual transformation with time, the idea in which Darwin based his theory. As evolution theory predicts the appearance of these phyla with such flowing gradual manner, crescendoing with time, as in figure 32. But these observations and clues that the Cambrian explosion provide made the appearance of the phyla happen with such a sudden way, shown in figure 33. Which shows that the scientific evidence pointing in the different direction of predictions of the evolution theory and this contradiction is so obvious that it can be seen by everyone, as one just needs to put these observations beside the predictions, as in figure 34.
And that's why Darwin admitted that the Cambrian explosion is one of the strongest evidence that refute his theory, where he says, If numerous species belonging to the same genre or families have really started into life at once, the fact would be fatal to the theory of evolution through natural selection. But Darwin was depending on the incompleteness of the fossil record, and he was predicting that the fossil record would be complete one day and become the way the theory predicts, and then it will reveal the existence of creatures before the Cambrian period, and then this big leap which destroys his theory would finally get out of the way. But here we are, after more than 150 years after this theory was published, and after the discovery of hundreds of thousands of fossils, the Cambrian explosion is still the same as it was in Darwin's time. And this observation was proved to be completely true, and not because of our lack of knowledge about the remaining fossil record. And we verified that these observations do certainly contradict the evolution theory's predictions. 6. The problem of the tragedy of common resources, an obstacle that the evolution theory can't overcome. Introduction This subject is an attempt to approach one of the most important paradoxes that can destroy the evolution theory. But it's not only the mere demonstration of the argument that destroys the theory, but rather a showcase of what the evolutionists have presented and what they are now presenting to deal with this problem, and a demonstration of what they themselves admit without question, because the result is really shocking. And for the reader who is searching for the truth to become a person who is able to make the correct judgment about this matter, even if they're not professional, because even the solutions that can be presented to deal with this problem can't be attributed to the evolution theory or its mechanisms. And this means that when the atheist searches for an explanation for the presence of life, they will find themselves facing one of two choices, believe in nothing or believe in the great creator. And evolution theory won't be one of those choices. This paradox doesn't only destroy the theory, but it also delicately proves direct intervention of an expert and knowledgeable power. And the biggest advantage it offers is that it achieves the condition of experimental testability like any acceptable scientific theory. And this advantage allows it to overcome the biggest obstacle intelligent design is also facing. Because as I mentioned in the first chapter, experimental science is unable to encompass all the truth, especially abstract truths like the meaning of design. And this has been exploited by evolutionists in order to make intelligent design seem like pseudoscience. But with God's help, we can make experimental science get to understand what design is, one way or another. Because this is not impossible, and this is indeed what this paradox will do to experimental methodology. In this chapter, I will, God willing, explain what is the paradox of the tragedy of common resources, and what kind of experimental evidence is used to prove it, and why it is a dilemma that the evolution theory can't overcome, and at the same time can't ignore, and how it is a direct evidence of the intervention of an extremely wise and knowledgeable power, and how we can verify it experimentally. 6-1. Evolution Theory and Cooperative Traits the cooperative behavior in living organisms was and still is the biggest challenge confronting the evolutionists, as the presence of cooperative traits among living organisms is a very perplexing evolution dilemma. It doesn't just exist, but it's a very widespread and dominant phenomenon, as the living kingdom is rampant with many forms of such cooperativeness, from the smallest organism to the biggest ones. But cooperativeness is always costly, because when you are able to give or do something for the benefit of other members of your society, you are then standing in opposite direction of the materialist way of thinking, even out in human society and our daily lives. Because from the point of view of materialist thinking, what could you possibly gain from regularly giving a certain amount of your salary to the poor, for example? And what would you gain from sympathizing with others when they have problems and giving them help and good advice? What would you gain from trying to rescue someone from sinking, or from burglary, or killing, or rape? All this might cause you losses, and you could even lose your own life. And of course there is no material gain worth mentioning if you do these things. Cooperation is a real problem for the evolution theory, as the theory embodies the materialist thinking in dealing with animals and all living systems. And discussions about this problem were heated during the 60s of the last century until the evolutionists came out with new inventions to enhance the situation and present us with materialist and pragmatic interpretations for these cooperative traits, saying that some of these traits benefit the cooperative individual one way or another, mutualism. And when some behaviors don't fit in this category, like altruism, for example, 
can have an indirect benefit in cases of altruism among relatives, for example, because relatives carry the same genetics and they pass them on to the next generations. And this benefits the individual who sacrificed themselves. In other words, benefit to the genes which cause them to behave this way. A mechanism known as kin selection. As the higher the degree of the relativity of these individuals who benefit from your cooperative traits, the more the benefit you give them comes back to you, one way or another. Because if these people succeed in surviving, this will cause all of your genes, or at least most of them, to be successfully transmitted to the next generations. And this is what supposedly motivates the living beings to transcend their instincts, from the evolutionist point of view. There is also the mechanism of spatial structure, which is the result of the way these animals grew, or them having to live separately for one reason or another or other restrictions imposed by the environment, which in the end guarantees that all creatures living in this closed society are cooperative, and the costs of this cooperation are equally divided between them, without any relative losses for the cooperative individual among all others. And this is enough to guarantee the continuation of cooperativeness. Also, there is the mechanism of punishment, employed by the insects, being builders of large cooperative societies, like ants, bees, and hives, and others, as there are individuals in these communities who punish those who fail to perform their active roles inside these communities, by excommunicating them. There is also a similar mechanism that is coercion, which consists of forcing the individuals to behave cooperatively, or do behaviors beneficial for the community as a whole and not the individual like the pheromones which queens release in order to suppress the ovaries of the worker bees so they don't produce eggs, to limit the sources of eggs, because that would corrupt the bee cell and the queen's eggs won't get the necessary attention and care. Another mechanism is the diminishing returns, and it's an attempt to restrain the competition for gaining benefits within the community in order to limit uncooperative or exploitive selfish behaviors. For example, if you feel really thirsty, then the first glass of water would quench your thirst 50%, and the second glass of water would make you 20% thirsty, and if you reach for a third glass, you might not be able to drink all of it. This saturation performs a role in limiting the competition for the resources, and consequently has a role in restraining the evolution mechanisms which push everyone to gain as many profits and gains they can despite of any costs. For example, Blood-sucking bats compete with each other for the best position to suck the victim's blood, but when they return to their dwellings at the end of the day, there will be those who would be about to burst from the loads of blood they had, and others whose bellies are empty, and then, after they were competing for this blood, they begin to share some of it among themselves, because of saturation. And this cooperative behavior guarantees that everyone gets what they need most days, because the same individual who would share the blood it sucked with its thirsty brother could be unable to find its food in the next day, and then it would borrow blood from others, and so on and so forth. So, saturation becomes the reason for this cooperative behavior. There are other mechanisms the evolutionists have been digging for for years, so they can explain the presence of cooperative traits among the living species. But why did cooperative traits need all these efforts? Because if we were to ask for the reason for the presence of any trait in any living being, the answer will be always ready. Mutations and natural selection. So what makes the basic evolution mechanisms unable to find an explanation for these cooperative traits? Why did it need outside help and many additional mechanisms like the ones I mentioned above? And do these additional mechanisms really solve the problem or not? The evolution theory predicts that the uncooperative, selfish individual within the living community would gain bigger profits because they are already inside a cooperative community without having to pay the expensive cooperation costs. And so they would beat the cooperative individual anywhere, supported all the time by natural selection wherever they go, as in figure 35, symbolizing the cooperative individual as W and the uncooperative as C. So if any circumstances arrive, like immigration or mutations, the cooperative individual is present in the same society as well as the uncooperative. And so the inescapable result will be the uncooperative individual beating the cooperative one, until cooperative individuals get fully extinct. And this result is affected by the very mechanisms of evolution. And here appears the contradiction. Because natural selection always selects those who cause the deterioration of the group and their efficiency, instead of selecting ones who raise the level of the well-being of this group as time passes. Because when the uncooperative individual beats the cooperative one, 
they would lose the cooperative traits on which the society basically depend, which would weaken the whole community to the degree that it might get totally extinct. And this includes the uncooperative individual too, in a phenomenon known as evolutionary suicide. And also the mutations which are supposed to always bring the new traits for the community will cause an inescapable confrontation between the cooperative and uncooperative individuals. And consequently, the basic evolution theory mechanics lead to the extinction of the cooperative traits, then destroy all life instead of preserving life. And that's why this theory needed resuscitation from these additional mechanisms, which presented nothing in actuality, as we'll see later. And hence comes the problem, and failed all the attempts of begging mercy for materialism. And this had been proved theoretically and experimentally. Theoretical mathematical concept expresses this truth using a method called the prisoner's dilemma. In this dilemma, the selfish strategies are always favored, despite the lack of efficiency it causes for the whole community. And that's why it's called a dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma consists of a mathematical model of the results of a meeting of all the different strategies. And what is the end result of this based on the resulting benefit? In which direction things will always evolve? The dilemma consists of an offer from the police to two suspects, from whom the police don't have an evidence of criminal conviction. And this offer is presented to each person independently. That if one of them confesses with what the other person did, they will be rewarded by releasing them, and their partner would get a three-year sentence in prison. If the opposite happens, the person gets imprisoned for three years, and their partner gets to be released. And if none of them confess, then each would be punished with two years in prison, as shown in Schedule 2. So turning the partner in is selfish, the bottom column of the schedule. And being silent is the cooperation, the upper column of the schedule. So, selfishness is always favored over cooperation, because each partner doesn't know what the other will do. If they keep silent, their partner might confess, and they get imprisoned for three years. And if his partner cooperates with them by being silent, both of them will be imprisoned for two years. So he has only the choice of either two or three years in prison. But if they are selfish enough, they will be released. Or in worst case scenario, they get imprisoned for two years. So he has a choice of either two years in prison or zero years. So everyone agrees that cooperation is subject all the time, anywhere, to be exploited by uncooperative individuals, and agree that the result of this interaction between the exploitive and the cooperative is in the interest of the exploitive. But reality doesn't support this premise, because living beings still exist, and their communities are rampant with cooperative individuals. And evolutionists admit all that, as whoever reads any scientific paper in the field of social evolution, for example, these ones, they would find that all what I mentioned here are axioms, which none of the evolutionists argue. And just some random quotes here and there. And for example, I will mention something easier than this, from this paper, the same reference 101. Cooperative behaviors that benefit other individuals have posed particular problems for evolutionary biologists. From the same paper, if explaining cooperation is one of the greatest problems for evolutionary biology, then explaining cooperation in microbes is one of the key aspects of this problem. And also this paper which says, Social evolution theory has devoted considerable attention to the fundamental problem of the evolution of cooperative behavior. And also in this paper, The origin of altruism is a fundamental problem in evolution. But despite these desperate attempts to present an evolutionist satisfying solution and interpretation of these cooperative traits by means of those additional mechanisms, after the fundamental mechanisms failed to do so, the problem is not over yet. It might have even just started. Because these mechanisms might explain the birth of cooperation from the womb of materialism, but they soon fail to make materialism mercy its offspring or let it reproduce and proliferate as these are all completely partial solutions, just like a painkiller that a patient takes to alleviate their pain. The painkiller alleviates the pain a little bit, but it doesn't remove the cause of the disease. And as the effects of the painkiller go away, the pain comes back. As all these partial mechanisms don't deal with the source of the problem, because it can never be solved with materialists' ways as I will show you later. Because a solution like spatial distribution can limit the confrontation between cooperative and uncooperative individuals in a society. But this, of course, doesn't last for long. And there is no mechanism among these that present a general and substantial solution to the problem. 
And as we mentioned, cooperation is really widespread in reality, and even interconnecting with all forms of life, because using general resources in an organized way, preserving the resources, is a cooperative behavior and all nature's resources are considered general, common resources. Moreover, cooperation is a helper in the production of these resources, and not just a wise consumer for them. As most simple-celled organisms depend on resources consisting of secretions produced by the cooperative individual, and this achieves the well-being for both of them, and not just the organism's personal advantage. And this happens in many forms, like absorbing and assimilating the nutrients reproduction and fighting against other species, and other life essentials, as cooperation is the producer of resources in the life of a big part of the animal kingdom, and it's the wise regulator of its consumption in the lives of the remaining living beings. So, if materialism won't heed wisdom and admits the importance of cooperation in the living kingdom, there will be no resources, no life, and no existence of anything. The bias towards cooperation necessitates a general mechanism to change the direction of things, and this mechanism doesn't exist in the fundamental mechanisms of the evolutionary theory, nor does it exist in the additional ones either. And if the mathematical modeling of the problem of cooperative traits is the prisoner's dilemma, the real-life modeling of it is the tragedy of the commons. 6-2. What is the tragedy of the commons? The tragedy of the commons, or the common resources, is a term invented by Hardin in an important scientific paper. It means that the cooperation among individuals to consume a resource can result in the disappearance of the resource itself, and consequently the disappearance of the whole biological system. And this can happen to all the natural resources because of the presence of uncooperative individuals who destroy these resources because of their unwise consumption, or by them beating the cooperative individuals and pushing them towards extinction. So the whole community gets destroyed because of the disappearance of the cooperative individuals. Evolutionary suicide. And those exploiters can be present in any living society, whether by means of mutations or by means of immigration of individuals from one place to another. This means that life must have ended billions of years ago, as it can never exist anywhere beyond the age of protozoa if things go normally. And evolution theory stays completely incapable of coming up with a solution that's consistent with its materialist philosophy to this lethal dilemma. 6-2-1 how is this dilemma a direct evidence of the intervention of a wise and knowledgeable power? Conscious intervention. Evolution goes in only one direction. That is pushing the individual towards acquiring the greatest amount possible of the benefits and gains without maximum limit. And since there is a threshold beyond which resources can't renew themselves, if consumption reaches it, the presence of this threshold is a fundamental condition for the existence of the resources. It's similar to the capital investment necessary for starting a business, which if any amount of it was consumed, the whole business collapses. Because if partners in any business happen to spend from the investment capital, because they don't count their profits and spend all the money coming into their safe, thinking that all that money is their net profit and that their capital investment is safe, then this business is unquestionably sinking into oblivion. And that's why counting the profits is the only way to avoid this problem. But this counting process needs awareness, because there is no physical mark to distinguish between the money that belongs to the capital investment and the profit money, but only calculations mathematically distinguished between them. And this is what makes things worse for the evolutionary theory, because this minimum limit has no physical existence, but only a mental mathematical existence that can only be recognized by calculating it. Therefore, blind materialist mechanics can't deal with it. Only one who has knowledge and wisdom can organize this by calculating this minimum limit and preserving it, to spite the materialist philosophy's nose. And the example Hardin puts forward in his paper to illustrate the tragedy of the commons was an open pasture where all shepherds were allowed to bring their cattle. The grass in this pasture has a minimum limit which it needs in order to renew itself. And if any of it is eaten, the whole pasture will be destroyed and it won't be able to renew itself. And this minimum limit has no physical existence, but only a mental mathematical one which comes by calculating the number of shepherds and the number of cattle owned by each shepherd, and the time the grass needs to rebegin its cycle. So, 
it's in everyone's interest to commit to a specific number of cattle and to bring no more into the pasture. But on the other hand, it's also in every shepherd's interest to bring more cattle into the pasture because that would bring them more money. And the costs, the pasture, will be divided among everybody and hence transgression can occur and the pasture gets damaged and everyone loses the pasture they depend upon. So all the solutions Hardin put forward in his paper required great skills and awareness. He suggested that the government gets involved in organizing this matter, or privatization, to assign a care provider for each section of the pasture. And all studies in this matter revolve around the same solutions, negotiations, agreements, etc. And this necessary intervention of ones who have knowledge and wisdom to organize this matter is shyly proved by the research and this completely destroys the materialist approach adopted by the evolution theory, which is devoid of any awareness or intelligence of one who has wisdom and knowledge. But this simple example shows the need for such an intelligent care provider, and here, blind materialism commits suicide, and all attempts to revive it fail. Conscious intervention is the only general mechanism capable of handling infinite possibilities of the tragedy of the commons to take place in any society and in any time by preventing selfish exploitation of the resources which causes the society to surpass the minimum limit necessary for the existence of these resources. And this can only be done by intricate mathematics, which can only be done by an all-knowing, all-wise being and impossible to be subject to a blind materialist mechanism. 6-2-2 What are the experimental evidence for the occurrence of the tragedy of the commons? Scientific research provided experimental evidence detecting the way this tragedy took place, or almost did in reality. And these are a few. Because the basic principle is that this tragedy is rarely allowed to happen, because there is organization and care. Unexpected if things were at the mercy of blind, purposeless mechanisms. But, because of God's providence, these few occasions took place, or almost did, to give a clear proof that solidifies the mathematical and logical proofs. For example, 6-2-2-1, a kind of cooperative bacteria called Myxococcus xanthus. This is a bacteria that lives in groups and attacks its victims in collective swarms. And when the food supply diminishes, it builds something called a fruiting body, which is a way to survive harsh conditions by producing germs that can endure enough to reproduce their next generations in better future conditions. Be he exalted, the one who thus inspired such weak creatures. The fruiting body's lower half consists of supportive rod-shaped spore producers, and its upper half consists of spores, as in figure 36. And each individual can either invest in building those rods or building spores. But without question, those who invest in building the spores are the ones whose offspring survive, because each spore will turn into a new bacterial colony, while those who continue to build the rods won't be able to survive as if the dominant strategy of a certain strain is non-cooperative exploitation, the green-colored ones, cheaters, in figure 36, because these want the biggest share possible, and so they only invest in building spores. The result will be that those get to survive, and the cooperative strain, which invests in building both rods and spores, will be extinct, those colored in red, figure 36, because they will keep producing only rods because of this uncooperative competition. And in the end, the selfish exploitative strain fails to build the fruiting body on its own because all its individuals are looking for the biggest profit, the result of which is that both strains get extinct. So here in this example, the resource which should be preserved is the minimum amount of the cooperative strain which can only be detected by study, and they can only be preserved by restricting the selfish strain from being with the cooperative one, and all this can't be regulated by any blind mechanism. 6-2-2-2 Bacteriophages, or the viruses that invade the bacteria cell and proliferate inside it, eventually destroying the cell. Here, the bacteria is the prey and the resource the viruses compete with each other in order to obtain. There are those who consume this resource wisely, and these are the cooperative strains, and there are other most vicious strains, and these are the exploitative strains, which consume the bacteria in a very short period of time. 
and this causes them to take over the cooperative ones, because they are stronger and they proliferate faster and exist in greater numbers. But they at the same time destroy themselves, because they proliferate strongly and in great numbers and consume all the existing bacteria, destroying the resource on which they feed. And this vicious proliferation can happen with all living beings, because if mutations favor the exploitative vicious individuals, nothing can stop them. And natural selection will support them as we previously showed, because they are the strongest in acquiring profits. Therefore, the ability to consume the resources must be determined and their reproduction regulated early, and regulated according to previous knowledge. There is no room for experimentation in reality, because the balance of the biological system can't afford it, especially that it consists of food chains. If each living being's reproductions is left unchecked, or reproduced beyond a certain limit or less than their necessary needs, this will cause a general disaster in the food chain of which they are a part. And that's because each species are both hunters and preys at the same time. And all this proves the existence of high precision and balance and previous planning for everything, and that there is no room for random experiments inside the biological system. 6-2-2-3 Cancerous cells are strongest in proliferation and spreading, and enduring lack of oxygen than all the other body cells. They are death-resistant, and have multiple strategies which make them more efficient than normal cells. Therefore, they are more profitable, and mutations and natural selection powerfully support their existence. Cancer eventually causes the death of the patient, and consequently cancer itself dies, as this evolutionary suicide that cancer commits is the natural result of the evolution mechanisms, which in reality is hostile towards life. As it's a genius micro example of the process of destroying life, the furthest from creating and preserving life. In the case of cancer, the tragedy of the commons takes place because the gaining of profits overcomes the need of capital investment, the minimum safety of the normal cells, the resources of this system on which the system's existence depends, and because there nothing separates between the profits and the capital investment in reality. All that cancer knows is that it's competing with the normal cells for food and place, and all the cells it destroys in the process have the same qualities, and so cancer isn't able to tell which of them are profits and which are capital investment that it shouldn't touch, or else the whole system collapses and all gains are lost. The author of this book has a scientific paper published in a professional scientific magazine discussing the subject of cancer disease as a practical example of the tragedy of the commons, titled as Invasive Cancer as an Empirical Example of Evolutionary Suicide. And evolutionary suicide is a term that means the same phenomenon we are discussing here, the tragedy of the commons. 6-2-2-4 In the Atlantic Ocean, in front of one of the beaches in Canada, there is a place known to be a focal point for the gathering of codfish, known as the Grand Banks which was abundant with this kind of fish, and then a great industry was established to hunt these fish with huge ships, and this caused a transgression of the threshold, the minimum survival and proliferation needs of the fish, and all the pressure of this hunt on the fish caused the selection of the fish that reach puberty and reproduction age faster, even though they reproduce less because of the diminishing of their fertility the result of which was the inevitable end of all the codfish there, and the collapsing of this industry within 30 years, 1960 to 1990. This collapse was caused by the vicious competition among these huge companies and ships, the inevitable result of which was the destruction of the very resource they depended upon. And because there is no physical mark distinguishing between the profits and the capital investment that should have been preserved, all the fish look like each other. Therefore, the transgression happened. Because such distinguishing can only be known through earnest studies to determine the minimum limit of fishes needed in order to proliferate, and by enforcing a law punishing those who disobey it by making them pay fines, if they hunt more than that limit, which would provide the desired protection for this resource to maintain its existence and reproduction. And all this needs awareness and power imposition, as such an aware intervention is the only solution to the problem. So what kind of a blind force among those blind evolution mechanisms can surround these things with its knowledge that can organize things if we are to replace these huge ships with living predators who eat the same amount that these ships hunt? The ecosystem will just get rid of them, even if mutations and natural selections bring them. 
The deliberate conscious handling of the delicate biological system cannot be denied or ignored and can never be conned. And those humans with their big ships represent this predator that the ecosystem could not support. Because humans have no special privilege among the living beings from evolution's point of view, and it's one of the species fighting each other for survival. 6-2-2-5 This example is an experiment conducted on the Japanese male Madaka fish, where a transgenic modification was performed through planting the growth hormone gene of the salmons, which caused those fish to increase in size, but at the same time it caused the diminishing of its fecundity. The females began to favor bigger modified males to the normal ones, which caused a gradual decrease in the numbers of this community until it crossed its threshold and its existence ended. Here also mutations can prevent this problem, because the size trait is genetically possible, and it already exists, but only it has been transmitted from the salmons. And that's why we say that the tragedy doesn't happen because of new traits, but it's enough for a species to be replaced by another profiteer in a resource that can't handle it. The resource here being the minimum numbers of males and females that a species can't survive without. The natural selection represented in sexual selection can't prevent the tragedy because the modified males have better advantages, ornament advantage, which make them better candidates. Taking a single trait from the salmon fish and putting it in the madaka fish caused the absolute extinction of the madaka. So how great is this precision and organization that the creator had put in his creation? And what kind of mind can say that billions of years of random distribution of the traits by means of mutations, then redistributing and refining them by means of natural selection caused all this? When seeing that a minimum change of the traits or its distribution causes total destruction in the biological system. 6-2-2-6 Competition among plants to reach for light and consuming all the energy provided by light which causes lack in the amount of energy necessary for the process of reproduction and producing seeds and consequently of the whole species. As in the beginning, the exploitative individuals blocking light from the others took over and destroyed the shorter cooperative breeds than the exploitative breeds failed to preserve the species because they have all wasted their energy in building longer stems, and then they couldn't find the means to produce seeds, causing the whole species to get extinct. And here is another form of the tragedy of the commons, even if the resource here, light, still exists, because light is still there, but the ability to reach for it was destroyed, causing the same result. And the same thing that happens during this competition to reach the light using longer stems happens in the roots as they compete for water. And all of this can be prevented by restraining the exploitative individuals from the beginning, like stopping one or two of the football audience from standing during the game. Because if they do, then everyone will have to do the same so they can continue watching. This doesn't cause better vision of the game, but a big hardship for all the audience and depriving those who can't stand from watching the game. So whether they all stand or all sit, it won't make a difference. That's why this behavior should be stopped from the beginning, so everyone can watch without hardship. But mutations can't tell the future, nor can it prevent one of those possibilities. It just brings and allows everything for the sole reason that it's genetically possible, without exception. This necessitates the gentle intervention of an all-knowing and wise creator who organizes everything and creates as he wills. Otherwise, the extinction of all plants with this manner would have been a very legitimate possibility. And surely, if plants disappeared, all animals and birds and everything else will follow. Because as we know, plants are the source of storing energy on Earth for the rest of the living animals. And they're also the source of oxygen on the planet. So how delicate and precise is the living system that God created? That if the minutest manipulation takes place, terrible and unimaginable consequences follow. And all this contradicts the current evolutionist scenario, based on continuous manipulation of the biological system, and on the premise that it can afford all these manipulations without collapsing. And what's worse, imagining that this continuous manipulation and random shooting is what drives the evolution wheel forward. 6-2-2-7 Cooperative insects like ants, bees, and hives 
Everyone knows that these species are rampant with many different forms of cooperation, and each one of these cooperative traits can lead to the tragedy of the commons if uncooperative individuals appear. One of the most intriguing things on which experimental studies focused is the response of worker bees to a chemical that the queen secretes called the pheromone in order to suppress the ovulation in these worker bees' ovaries. Because the only female in the bees' and ants' colonies who has got the right to reproduce is the queen. And this is in the good interest of the whole colony because the new generation have the best and strongest traits, and the workers get to save the energy necessary to take care of these eggs, until they hatch and everyone takes its own role inside the colony. The existence of a mutation that doesn't cause this response in worker bees is a very possible occurrence, and if this happens, the whole colony gets destroyed, because the queen's eggs won't find the necessary attention and care, and the worker bees' offspring will inherit weaker traits, which won't enable them to survive, especially with the escalation of the conflicts between the offspring of each worker, and between the queen's offspring if they exist, and thus everybody loses. The tragedy happens, and the whole species gets extinct. And here, a preventative mechanism was discovered that prevents the tragedy from happening. That is pleiotropy or the gene that influences multiple phenotypic traits, meaning that the gene's interpretation inside the body is two traits, and not just one. And the two traits have no relationship between them whatsoever. They found that the gene responsible for affecting this response in the worker bees, which the queen secretes, is the same gene that stimulates the worker's ovaries. So, if a mutation that causes the loss of the ability of the workers to respond to the pheromone, they will lose at the same moment the ability to stimulate their own ovaries. And bees avoid the occurrence of this tragedy because of the existence of this additional mechanism. And instead of the evolutionists asking themselves why specifically these two traits binding to one gene of other infinite traits, they are happy and satisfied now that they know the reason why the tragedy doesn't happen to this trait in the bees, even though it's something that belongs only to these social insects, and can't be generalized over all cooperative traits within bees themselves. If they are intelligent, they would know that this is the work of a wise and knowledgeable creator who knows what would happen if the response is lost, so he tied it to something that would make the bees avoid this disaster. But these people don't understand, and in spite of that, we can attribute the existence of that obstacle to God's will, because organization and knowledge of the consequences of things and this high precision clearly exist. They attribute this to pure chance, and the blessings and support of the natural selection. But unfortunately for them, mutations and natural selection support the getting rid of this gene at the same time, and thus, the evolution mechanisms get out of the scene completely, as I will show soon in detail, God willing. To summarize, the tragedy of the commons is general in the biological system, and its result is total extinction of the whole system. And this can be only prevented by the intervention of a knowledgeable and wise being. And this lets us know that life can only be explained by attributing it to the Great Creator. 6-2-3 The Inevitable Question If the whole biological system is subject to the tragedy of the commons, then why does life still exist? And why didn't everything get extinct? And that's it. I didn't invent this question but rather it's a central question in the science of biology and a challenge that will always remain in front of the evolution theory as long as it lasts. It's a well-known and famous question that you can find in many scientific papers, like this one for example. What keeps competition from destroying the common good that could be created by cooperating? Egbert Lee Jr. Lee, 1999. The question is considered one of the fundamental problems in evolutionary biology. Lee. 1977, 1983, 1999, Bus, 1987, 1999, Frank, 1995, Maynard Smith and Zathbury, 1995, Wilson, 1997, Mishad, 1999, Reeve and Keller, 1999, Foster and Ratniks, 2001. Then the paper's author list an assortment of old as well as recent research dealing with the same question. This paper also asks the same question. The observation that evolutionary suicide can result from common evolutionary phenomena, such as selection for higher harvesting intensity or for higher growth rate, raises a fundamental question. If this phenomenon is widespread, then why does life generally persist? 
All the solutions that have been presented for this problem are insufficient and purposeless because they are partial solutions for a general phenomenon that has infinite possibilities, which makes these solutions only a deviation from the right answer, no more and no less. The truth is, the existence or the non-existence of these additional partial mechanisms are equal, and they can't save the evolution theory from this problem. And this is what I will show you in the coming section. 6-3 an example that shows the complete fallibility of the evolution theory's mechanisms, the fundamental as well as the additional ones, when it comes to the tragedy of the commons. There is a very widespread phenomenon among bacteria called the stationary phase, because if bacteria proliferate in greater numbers than the available resources, it will get extinct within a few hours, as a result of the tragedy of commons. And that's why the Creator instilled in it a very complex machine consisting of chemical compounds which enable the bacteria to know the number of other bacteria around, how much of the resources is available, and it determines the rate of its proliferation accordingly, meaning that they will willingly stop or carry on with the reproduction according to its calculation of its share of the available resources. This behavior saves it from the tragedy of the commons, represented here by the outside available resources. And this behavior is considered one of the additional mechanisms I listed in the beginning, improvised to save the evolution theory, which is the mechanism of coercion. Because restricting the growth happens because of the activation of certain genes working on restricting the growth. And this happens to the bacteria in a coercive way. In fact, it's hard to imagine that such a system can exist without previous knowledge and strict planning in its design. So, be he exalted, the creator who planted this orderly system in these creatures to work forcefully in a bacteria that doesn't have consequences. This system governs a lot of genes within the bacteria, and it's called quorum sensing, which consists of complicated interactions as shown in figure 39. And this mechanism is called an irreducible complex mechanism, because it can't come to existence gradually. Quorum sensing organizes most of the cooperative traits in bacteria and it can be likened to a huge network between individuals of the same species and different species. And there is a language between gram-negative bacteria and another language between gram-positive bacteria. There is a third universal language, and an example of universal connection through this network, luminous bacteria, like the V. Harvey, coordinates with massive numbers in the sea in order for all of them to start emanating light at a specific time and end at a specific time, to achieve a certain purpose, which causes the illumination of a vast area of the ocean that can be seen by satellites. And this is what one research recorder for three consecutive nights, during which the satellite detected these bacteria illuminated an area calculated to be 15 square kilometers of the Indian Ocean, as shown in figure 40. And of course, the presence of such high-tech networks is in itself enough for any truth seeker in order for them to know that this universe has an all-knowledgeable, all-wise creator and that such high precision order is irreducible, because a network of unfailing communication cannot have appeared into existence through chance, nor can it come into existence gradually by means of natural selection. Yes, primitive networks can develop into more sophisticated ones with the evolution mechanisms, because the more strength they achieve, natural selection will select them. But without the foundations that form something called network, the evolution mechanisms have no function whatsoever, and whomever approves that networks can formulate themselves in a haphazard and spontaneous manner, and consecutive strokes of luck, like the thief and the electric elevator, they then contradict reason, and sane people, and join the evolutionists, because they approve this without any hesitation, and they regard this system as an additional mechanism or a preventative method that stops the bacteria from destroying its resources. They don't find anything amazing or astonishing in this matter, and they don't find it a strange phenomenon that these complicated, irreducible networks exist. To them, this matter doesn't provoke them enough to stop and reconsider the situation or look for a more suitable explanation. For them, it's just like waking up each morning to find complicated networks appear out of random beating around in our cities. But it's okay. We will tolerate our opponents and ignore all of this and accept the existence of the fragmentary additional mechanisms or hindrances, like the quorum sensing and others, which save the biological system all the time and everywhere from destroying its resources, and thus saves it from the tragedy. And we will convince ourselves for a moment 
that is completely normal and that there is not any madness in Darwinism. But the biggest surprise is that the tragedy of the commons will destroy the biological system in spite of the existence of these hindrances and additional mechanisms. That's why any partial success of these can't save the evolution theory. That's why this matter is amazing and worth our attention. And that's why I say that the tragedy of the commons is the problem that the evolution theory can never overcome or ignore. If hindrances that would stop the individuals from transgressing the minimum limit the resources need as a condition to survive, and this successfully resulted in protecting the resources and keeping them, whether they are external common resources like food and water and others, or internal resources like represented by the individuals who have the cooperative traits that the community can't survive without, and the reason for the presence of these hindrances is random mutation or chance then natural selection will doubtlessly keep these hindrances because they save the whole community which was on the verge of collapse. But the most intriguing point in this subject is that chance will also bring exploitative individuals who can surpass these hindrances or additional mechanisms, something that no evolutionist denies. And natural selection will select them too, as we mentioned in The Prisoner's Dilemma. As selfish, exploitative individuals are always favored by natural selection, and that's the reason I said in the beginning that evolutionists succeeded in extracting the cooperative traits from the womb of materialism. But they completely failed to make materialism protect this weak offspring of hers. The paradox here is that chance and natural selection support the presence of these mechanisms, and at the same time support overcoming it. There is no evolutionist solution to the problem, because the evolution theory is completely neutral in this case. Therefore, it can't choose one side and leave the other. These mechanisms can either be kept or overcome. One can't describe a thing as both neutral and not neutral in the same case. And a neutral judge can't make a conclusive decision on the case. If two people disputed over the color of a car, or a house, or shoes, for example, it would be unimaginable for this dispute to be resolved by a blind man, because he is totally neutral in this case. He can't prove which one of them is right. The evolution mechanics seemingly announce that they are neutral and have no conclusive decision about this problem, or in other words, that it should be completely gotten out of the scene when trying to solve this problem, because it won't be useful and can have no effect whatsoever. Reality, on the other hand, announces every moment and everywhere that cooperative traits tips the scales of truth, most of the time, or else the biological system would have never existed. We're still with the example and the system of quorum sensing as a hindrance mechanism, and we now know that evolution mechanisms would support and maintain it if happy chance brings it to the scene. Now we will see how evolution mechanisms will also support overcoming this system, and that the theory is completely neutral. Experimental research on a type of bacteria called E. coli proved that the most widespread strain of this bacteria is the wild type, the original strain of which enters into a stationary phase when resources and nutrients are depleted as a best adaption technique to the situation at hand and to postpone its reproduction to better circumstances in the future. In this case, it stops growing and proliferating, and it reduces its vital functions as much as it can, and to guarantee its supply of the limited nutrients the longest time possible. Thus, it survives the tragedy of the commons, which could have happened to it if it surpasses the minimum limit of the resources by its continuous growth and reproduction. And bacteria regulates all these genetic and environmental changes by using quorum sensing, so it becomes the hindrance stopping the bacteria from overconsumption of the resources, and consequently, the extinction of both resources and the bacteria. But this hindrance, having supposedly appeared into existence by means of mutations and continued to exist thanks to natural selection, is subject to violation, also thanks to mutations and natural selection, by a selfish individual who doesn't respond to this system because of a mutation that happened to him. And consequently, it exploits the fact that the original species stopped its reproduction, so it can reproduce faster and consume all the resources, destroying the cooperative kind. Then it gets extinct because of its consumption of all its resources and ignorantly trespassing the minimum limit. And here the tragedy of the commons takes place on two levels, the general external resources and the cooperative individuals, considering these as a common internal resource. And natural selection gets to support the exploitative individual mutant, because it's more vicious in acquiring profits. And this has been described in many researches, including this one. It has also been observed in other kinds of bacteria and viruses, cancers, insects, birds, fish, and plants. 
Its occurrence is possible in all of the biological system without exception, and that's why it isn't possible to ignore or go around this problem, and Darwinists can't turn the blind eye to it or postpone it to the future like they did with many very obvious dilemmas, like irreducible complexity and the emergence of the vast majority of the living beings all at once in the Cambrian explosion, and the contradictions between the fossil records and the predictions of the evolution theory, and many other dilemmas. And that's because the tragedy of the commons is not a historical event that ended, but a problem that renews itself anticipated each moment and everywhere, and it can also be subjected to experimentation. So where's the way out? So, it's not possible to have a solution for this problem in an evolutionary context, whether hindrances exist or not, and whether these are many or few, because these additional mechanisms in reality can't stop the fundamental mechanisms of the evolution theory, mutations and natural selection, from supporting the selfish who's going to violate them, and thus it will always be breachable, like the common resources protected by the hindrances in the first place. And there remains one approach that can provide us with a general and inclusive and substantial solution. That is bringing the mechanism of conscious intervention into the scene, because it's the only mechanism that can deal with the mathematical existence of the minimum limit of the resources, which is the essence of the problem. 6-4. Is the conscious intervention mechanism testable, and can it be verified experimentally? Bacteria is the best candidate for studying all the evolution mechanisms in a practical way, and choosing among the evolutionary scenarios. And this is due to its short lifespan, its existence in great numbers, and the easiness with which its environmental conditions can be controlled, and also because it's easy to affect genetic modifications within it in order to either make it acquire new traits or eliminate its original ones. And that's why the biggest battlefield that can either make the evolution theory victorious or totally destroy it is inside the labs of bacteria and prokaryotic organisms. And most of the fundamental conditions that the bacteria needs in its life are based on cooperative traits, as bacteria only live in organized groups. And in addition to that, they literally build cities so they can live inside them. And these cities are surrounded with strong walls from all sides, made of materials that have special characteristics that protect what's inside these cities from any external attack. There are passageways inside those cities to take out the excretions and others to allow the nutrients inside and distributing the oxygen. Even work is distributed among the bacteria by means of genetic orders, determining the specialty of each cell. The city is called biofilm, and it includes 99% of the microbial life. And this biofilm sticks to the surfaces of living beings' bodies, or to the surface of non-living things, and it gives the bacteria tremendous strength to cope with the surrounding harsh conditions, and keeps it alive, even if it's boiled, or if the liquids carrying the bacteria are boiled. And this makes it a thousand times more resistant to antibiotics, compared to its resistance when it's outside the biofilm. This biofilm, in its construction and development, is a group work, and a perfect example of cooperation. Therefore, it's subject to invasion by the uncooperative individuals, as we previously explained. And the biofilm is the cause of the chronic diseases that don't respond to antibiotics or to any medicines. And it could keep the patients chronically diseased with these vicious ailments for tens of years, with symptoms that could be sometimes severe and some other times less severe, or vanish for some time. But soon these symptoms return, and the cycle goes on indefinitely. This is why attacking this disease with injecting the patient with uncooperative individuals modified genetically inside the labs will result in the destruction of the original type, and afterwards it can be easy to kill the uncooperative individuals. This means that we will deliberately create the tragedy of the commons inside the patient's body, which will result in the destruction of the whole microbial society, and the patient gets cured. Some evolutionists did begin to mention timidly this remedial approach in many researches, while preserving the respect facade of the evolution theory until now. In this research, for example, the researchers demonstrated the idea of invading disease causing bacterial biofilms by means of injecting the patient with uncooperative individuals to eradicate the original type. The latter, of course, is based on cooperation, and they called this model the Trojan horse, after the old Greek myth. 
In a metaphor that fits those matters which have strong outer appearance, but in actuality, they're lethal, because those uncooperative individuals which will be injected will comfortably mingle with the cooperative individuals inside their strong, impenetrable fortress, then destroy everything totally. Those who have written this research and similar researches are evolutionists. This explains why there is an obvious hesitation in the manner with which they produce these researches, because releasing this idea completely destroys the evolution theory, as the first obvious question that comes to mind is, if cooperative traits are dominant among the living species, and if they don't withstand the exploitative traits that lead to the destruction of all life forms, and if the evolution mechanisms can't stop this inevitable result, then who organizes and brings such order to life? Restricting these exploitative traits from existing in the amounts and degrees which can cause the extinction of life on Earth. Because this question has one answer, the evolutionists handle this subject with extreme caution, because they know that elaborating on this subject will destroy their theoretical foundations of understanding life in a Darwinian manner. The medical benefits that can be acquired from this new remedial method are big, because it can cure difficult bacterial diseases, and also viral infections, and maybe even cancer, because cancer cell communities are based on cooperative traits too. But each selfish genetically modified strain we take out from the laboratory succeeding in wiping out the natural type is an experimental evidence for the mechanisms of conscious intervention because the lack of its existence in the first place can only be explained by the presence of a provident one who intervenes to stop it, just like its existence in an evidence for someone who wanted them to exist for medical reasons. Because this selfish trait, which was made inside the laboratory, and its non-existence in nature reveals that there is previous knowledge of the harmful effect it can have, and that its existence inside the bacterial society will cause transgression of the minimum limit of the resources, and consequently cause the tragedy of the commons, and the wiping out of the whole bacterial existence, and that's why he wanted to prevent it. Because the existence of this trait which we manufactured by means of genetic modification is possible in nature. So why did mutations bring this trait into the living world after billions of years? If it appears, no evolutionary mechanism can stop it as we previously mentioned. And the result would have been the extinction of all forms of life because all living beings will be subject to the same thing, the invasion of the selfish and the tragedy. Consequently, the evolutionary mechanisms don't and can't have a real explanation for life unless we add to it the mechanism of conscious intervention. And it's a necessary mechanism that can be verified experimentally. But because it contradicts the materialist atheist philosophy which the theory of evolution was originally founded for the sake of strengthening and supporting it, and so it won't be easy for the scientific community to admit the existence of this mechanism, in spite of the obviousness of its theoretical and empirical supportive evidence. And the author of this book has a scientific paper published in a pre-publishing website, which is a website where researchers get to publish their papers for a period of time until they're verified by the experts and published in scientific magazines. In this paper, I gathered all these ideas I proposed in this book about the dilemma of the tragedy of the commons, and I proposed the conscious intervention mechanism as a mechanism that fulfills the condition of experimental verification. But I'm still suffering from the obstinacy of the evolutionists, and I wasn't able to publish it in a scientific magazine until now. But with God's help, I will not stop trying. 6-5 Conclusion the tragedy of the common resources is a dilemma that kills evolution, and its fundamental or additional mechanisms with which the evolutionists tried to save the theory will never work, because they all remain subject to the tragedy itself in the end, and there is only one solution for this dilemma, the presence of someone who can preserve the minimum limit required for the maintenance of the natural resources. This limit is a mathematical calculation that doesn't have a material existence, meaning we can never know it unless we do extremely intricate calculations. And this is only in the power of someone who has great knowledge and awareness. And this shows that the matter can only be solved by the all-knowing, knowledgeable, all-wise to bring order to this matter. And this is what's meant by the conscious intervention mechanism. This is a mechanism that can be empirically verified by deliberately creating the tragedy in the disease-causing bacterial communities by means of growing genetically modified bacteria with selfish traits, which causes the wiping out of the bacterial community altogether. 
If the occurrence of the tragedy in this experiment proves the existence of deliberate creation of the selfish traits, then the lack of occurrence of this tragedy in real existence proves that there is a certain power that wants to stop the selfish traits from existing in enough numbers to destroy life. Number 7. Comparison between evolution and intelligent design. Statement 1. The phenomenon of life is explained in a fulfilling and correct manner with the materialist evolution mechanisms. Evolution theory? Valid. Intelligent design? Invalid, because it's an extra hypothesis that's not needed and should be eliminated according to Occam's razor principle. Number 2. Statement. If there is a phenomenon or many phenomena that can't be explained by evolution mechanisms. Evolution theory contains an error or a deficiency or simply needs adjustment, and this adjustment is probably another materialist mechanism. Intelligent design. It doesn't have to be right, because if the evidence for its correctness is our lack of knowledge of the true explanation of the phenomenon, then this is a logical fallacy known as appeal to ignorance. Number 3. Statement. If there is a phenomenon or a number of phenomena like the Cambrian explosion, irreducible complexity, the avoidance of the tragedy of the commons, which can't be explained by means of evolutionary mechanisms but can be explained by intelligent design or conscious intervention. Evolution theory? Invalid. If intelligent design mechanisms succeed in fulfilling the condition of experimental verification and there is no other experiment that refutes the intelligent design's hypothesis. Intelligent design? Valid succeeding in fulfilling the condition of experimental verification, and there is no other experiment that refuted the intelligent design's hypothesis. Number 4. Statement. Testability and empirical verification is one of the conditions of scientific theory. So what is the position of evolutionary and intelligent design mechanisms in regards to this condition? Evolution theory. Some mechanisms met this condition like mutations and natural selections. These are testable in regards to their occurrence, but they fail to meet this condition when new complete organic functions of the living organism appear, let alone the emergence of a new living being. Intelligent Design The mechanism of conscious intervention meets this condition as it's a testable mechanism which hypothesizes that there are infinite possibilities of the existence of uncooperative organisms which have been deliberately prohibited from existing in the first place. And if these organisms come to life, they would be supported by the evolutionary mechanisms instead of prohibiting them, causing a grave disaster to the balance needed for these organisms to live, which results in destroying the original cooperative type and also the selfish type. And this didn't happen in reality, and this empirical verification will be affected by means of genetic engineering inside the microbes and using them to attack the original kind, which causes the extinction of both in the end. Therefore, we can't assume that the evolutionary mechanisms will prevent those selfish traits, because in fact, they support their existence and proliferation, and we can't assume that these infinite possibilities of the existence of selfish individuals, something that can cause the extinction of all life, and a very real possibility in every part of the living kingdom, we can't say that we're lucky we're still alive, because chance prevented these from appearing into our existence in the first place, and the only reasonable explanation is that these these have been prevented on purpose because we can reverse this process and deliberately create these selfish individuals in order to verify this mechanism experimentally. So if the occurrence of this tragedy in the experiment is real, then this proves deliberate intervention to create these destructive organisms. And likewise, because the tragedy doesn't occur in nature, then this proves that there is a power that wanted to prevent the existence of these selfish traits. Statement Number 5. Falsifiability is one of the conditions a scientific theory must meet. So what is the position of the evolution theory and intelligent design in regards to this condition? And are there any refuting phenomena and experiments? Evolution Theory Contradictory phylogenetic relationships in the polygenetic tree if we try to assemble it using similar genes or proteins by any means is a contradictory observation and refutation of the evolution theory. And also the fossil record doesn't match with the scenario the theory predicts, especially in regards to the phenomenon of the Cambrian explosion. As the evolutionary scenario is falsifiable in some of its aspects, 
and this is in the good interest of the theory, and it fulfills this condition, but it's certainly not in its good interest that the contradictory observations are happening in reality, and this is what happened. Intelligent Design 1. Irreducible complexity is falsifiable, because if an irreducibly complex organ or system developed in accordance with the evolutionary mechanisms, this could be a refutation of the argument of irreducible complexity. 2. Conscious intervention is falsifiable. If there is a general materialist mechanism that can prevent the selfish traits from destroying the biological system, and if such a mechanism can cover all the great many possibilities challenging life each moment and everywhere, then this would be a refutation of the conscious intervention mechanism. But such mechanism simply doesn't exist in reality, and it's improbable for it to exist, as all the proposed mechanisms are fragmentary. They can prevent the selfish traits, but only in certain conditions, and it can't deal with all the possibilities. And the reason for that is that the key solution to the problem, and the root of the problem, is knowing the minimum limit that the natural resources need in order to renew themselves, the threshold beyond which the whole living community gets destroyed. And this limit has a mathematical existence, and not a materialist one, which necessitates the presence of intelligence and awareness.